Uh, hey, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Andy Jensen. I am the co-chair of the Government Affairs Committee on the board for Inspire Washington. And I am thrilled that to have uh, you folks here uh, to uh, hear about uh, SB 5878, the Arts Education Bill. And uh, I'll turn it over to my co-host, uh, Danielle, and then Manny. So Ms. Danielle Gall. Hi, my name is Danielle. I'm the arts education person with Inspire Washington. Happy to be here. Always a resource. <laughs> and hello, I'm uh, Manny Quillen, executive director for Inspire Washington. Also a huge proponent for arts education and a board member for Arts Ed Washington. But, but I'm here just to learn like all of you about this new and exciting public policy proposal. <clears throat> all right. Um, fantastic. Well, uh, I'll just go through it right quick. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the problems with, you know, education in Washington State uh, is that students are not receiving equal access to arts education in public schools. And by equal, we truly mean equal. Um, there is a credit requirement just in high school of two credits, um, to, uh, two arts credits to graduate high school. But uh, many school districts and school buildings are waiving that very quickly, sometimes with reasons that they just don't have the teachers or the space to do it. But often someone, a student can just request it and that's it. But um, one of the um, uh, problems is that uh, also that there um, are a low number of the specialists that are actually available to, uh, to actually do this, uh, whether it's accreditation through the local school district um, or, or the state. Um, many folks on here, I'm sure, are also working as independent teaching artists or have hired independent teaching artists. And a lot of times um, they're in as special as just um, a specialist or a, an artist in residence. Um, and uh, sometimes cannot uh, join a teaching staff as a full-time teacher. Um, this bill helps to address that a little bit. So next slide, please. All right. One of the reasons that this bill was brought, uh, was created um, was also that, um, uh, that the number of students in the arts classes uh, uh, who can take arts classes, buildings with less than 25% of pre-reduced lunch, almost 70% have some sort of arts class during the school day. Um, and um, for students who, and school buildings that have a tremendous amount of students on pre reduced lunch, less than 50% do. Um, and, uh, and again, arts are required as part of a basic education in Washington State. And too many of our students and our, too many of our school buildings are not getting that arts uh, recommendation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and also, we, we can't ignore the uh, racial component of this. Um, with glass half full, there is progress being made of more than 50% of Black and African American um, students that are enrolled in arts classes, um, but they're not meeting up with their white counterparts at 66%. Um, uh, this is from the King County Arts Education, and um, King County does have the Seattle Public School District, which has 55,000 students. Um, it's the largest in the state, um, so it, that covers a pretty good, pretty good amount. Um, so uh, Senate Bill 5878 will uh, help with that. Oh, and look, there's the solution right there. Um, so one of the great things about this bill is that um, the bill would make it law that arts education must be part of the regular uh, instruction or during the school day. So there would be an arts class just like there is reading, just like there is uh, language arts, just like there's math, just like there's science, just like there's social studies, just like there's PE, there would be an arts class during the regular school day. And that's actually kind of a big deal. A lot of um, schools are allowed, um, and sometimes often for very good reasons, um, that there's just not the teacher available during the school day. So there's some after school activities um, and uh, it can be waived. Uh, another great thing that's specific about this bill is that the instruction time for the arts class must be equal with other core subject requirements during the school day. So again, this is really fantastic because um, too often uh, 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 an oral book report can be used as a performance credit. And we know that while that's 
an important ability to do to speak in front of public folks. Um, that's not exactly a you know a theater class or a performance class. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are parts uh, uh, that it's difficult for schools to hire the teachers available, um, especially at, at the elementary to K-5 level. So schools are allowed to use existing teachers or to hire new ones um, for the explicit purpose of teaching the visual or performance arts. Um, OSPE does have a really great uh, rubric for teachers, especially in K-5, um, to teach uh, the minimum um, arts requirement. We never want the minimum to be the standard. Um, however, for you know smaller school districts, or you know for those amazing teachers who are you know teaching with classrooms of you know 25, 30, 35 students, um, there is a rubric where they can teach um, a basic minimum um, to meet the requirements for visual and performing arts. Um, another great thing about the bill 5878 is that um, these classes must. Uh, in K-8 must offer these classes all year long and every student must receive this instruction throughout their K-8 experience. Um, and I clarified this bill so it wasn't like, hey, you get to do a play once between kindergarten through eighth grade. No, throughout their K-8 education experience. Um, so again, that, uh, that arts, uh, performing arts or visual arts experience and hopefully both um, will be available and uh, practiced just like science, just like social studies, just like math, uh, just like reading and language arts. Um, so it's fantastic that this is becoming actual law. Um, and then uh, uh, for the next slide, yeah, um, uh, for in high school, uh, in the substitute bill that's been that was recently passed, um, high school um, the performing arts uh, must be offered all year, all year round. Um, they will not be a requirement in uh, because of the because of the um, uh, because of the substitute bill. The arts in ninth through twelfth can still be used as credits, as elective credits, to help uh, meet that twenty-four graduation uh, high school uh, requirement. Um, where this was allowed in and where it helped is that since K through eight is required for students uh, if 58, 78 passes, um, students are still gonna have a really strong foundation in the visual and performing arts, kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, I know we've got a small audience here, but I'm, I'm sure there are some of us who took those minimum math requirements or minimum science requirements in, in high school and maybe in middle school or maybe uh, with a gold language. And as soon as you hit that minimum, you're like, fantastic, I never have to do that again. Um, however, uh, you know, it's good to know that for some students who have had that K through eight experience, um, if they're finding other ways in their graduation pathways, if the arts aren't a part of that, that's, that's up to them. However, we also know that there are gonna be students because they've had that exposure K through eight in the visual and performing arts, once they get to high school, and since in this bill, it is, uh, uh, it is, it will be the law that high schools have to have art, uh, visual and performing arts available. There are going to be students who will want to take those arts classes as they're elected to go to those, um, those, um, uh, to go through those um, requirements. So um, that says can't be waived except for special education requirements. With a substitute bill that's still being negotiated a little bit um, to give the schools the flexibility that they and their students need. Um, what else is fantastic about this bill is that, and I'm just going to read the slide, the instruction under this section must be solely for the arts discipline in the skills and craft of each specific arts discipline as their own end, rather than as a vehicle to enhance learning in any non-art subject area. This is actually a really big deal. Um, I, you know, I'm sure folks on this call have, have said, oh yes, we've you needed an arts class that helps all these other uh, test scores and math and reading abilities, which is true. But that's not why we do those arts classes. Uh, one of my dear friends from high school is an arts teacher um, in high school. And she, when she goes into this meeting, she comes in with her, uh, with her paper and her paintbrush and says, I teach this. You don't see a math book in my hand. Um, I, teach how to, I teach kids how to paint. Um, and the bill that allows it. Um, 
So uh, the other great thing is that um, since the arts do increase those math scores, uh, help students stay in school, um, they can still do that to help those things. But the primary reason is that the students and the teachers are there to work and learn those visual and performing arts. Um, so the, again, it's great that that still is in there. Um, so this just shows, you know, uh, right now um, uh, for the uh, Washington State, two arts credits are required for high school graduation. Right now, um, uh, school districts have a lot of leeway to make it one or two. Um, and uh, as we see there, that other data point, 57% of the students who graduated with fewer than two arts credits. Again, it can be waived very easily. Um, and uh, the waiver is, will be a little more stringent this time when the, if the bill gets passed. Um, and again, since students are gonna be having a really, really strong K-8 foundation in, in visual and performing arts, and uh, visual and performing arts must be offered all throughout high school, ninth through 12th grade. We think more students are gonna be able to take those classes as their elective uh, to meet their graduation requirements. Um, so here are some fantastic resources uh, that NEL created. Um, there's the National Research for American City Arts. There's new stuff going in here all the time. Um, and uh, it's great to see so many of the same uh, outcomes uh, coming from across the country of how the visual and performing arts are helping students stay in school and becoming more well-rounded citizens. That King County Arts Education Data Dashboard um, was created in November of 2020, and that uh, is a fantastic um, way to look at all the disparities um, that uh, students in school buildings have to get um, from the uh, to get uh, in their communities and in their schools. And one thing that is consistent all the way through in that King County Arts Education Data Dashboard is. Students and families say they want more art. Principals and teachers say they want more art. And everyone says we don't have enough. Um, and uh, so this bill helps to address that. And then if you really want to get wonky, there's the original bill and the first substitute bill uh, that Senators Rolf and uh, Wellman created. Um, the original bill was, again, Senators uh, Rolf and Wellman. Um, and uh, they created this. And then they heard um, the concerns on that first bill from the Washington State Board of Education um, and the Washington uh, Education Association. Uh, and that, that first substitute bill helped address some of those concerns. Um, and, uh, and again, some of that concern was the flexibility that um, school districts and school buildings needed to make sure they're meeting the needs of their communities. Um, so some of the questions uh, that we're going to ask you to, to ask your lawmakers um, are these three are these three right here um, to make sure there are enough teachers throughout the state to make this happen in the 2023-2024 school year, especially outside the I-5 corridor in Spokane. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, so many of the ways students are receiving arts in the school, whether during the regular school school day or as an extracurricular is through a teaching artist who is working you know, four or five other jobs, driving all over their community, making sure that students are, are getting some sort of arts education, um, whether that's visual arts, whether that's performing arts. Um, we need to make sure that there are enough teachers with the accreditations available to them to make sure they can step into these roles that they've already been doing as an independent artist, make sure they can join their teaching community. Um, and that leads into that second question of what policies uh, can happen to enact this bill um, so that all of these independent teaching artists have the access um, to get that teaching accreditation um, in their school mm -hmm. district. Um, since they've already been doing this work as an independent artist, what are ways that they can um, you know, join the teachers union and make sure that they uh, can also um, get the state accreditation to be a public school teacher? Um, and this especially affects these smaller districts. Um, you know, uh, the that waiver is in there for a reason. It's not because they don't want art. Um, that waiver is in there because there are so many other um, needs that communities have um, uh, to get their career and technical education requirement 
uh, to get a social studies requirement. Um, so many of these students have jobs as well um, to help support their families. Um, so again, these smaller districts and smaller communities really need help to make sure that the teachers who and the independent artists who are doing this work um, can get that, that official stamp of approval and make it easier for folks who have already been doing this work um, to get that accreditation. And of course, any other questions that, that you have. And hey, we've got 10 minutes left, perfect. Um, so uh, for the folks who are here on this call, what other questions um, would you uh, like to ask of us? We kind of got the, the full thing uh, covered. Uh, Danielle has amazing wealth of knowledge of arts education requirements. I'm the government wonky policy guy and Manny is Manny. Manny knows everything. Um, so uh, if uh, you all have any questions you can put in the chat or ask and um, we're so happy that you joined us and glad you can share this with your communities and with your um, uh, and with your legislators as well. Um, so thank you so very, very much uh, for joining. Um, I have a question. This is Halea. Um, I'm with Arts Corps um, and the Teaching Artists Guild. I'm, I'm curious, uh, what are some of the proposals for emergency licensures um, or, uh, you know, substitute licensures for teaching artists? I know we would have several people who might be interested in something like that. Um, and then the other question I'm going to get hit with is money. Who, where's the money for these FTE? Because uh, mm -hmm. it's not for lack of want half of most Absolutely. of these schools, um, it's, it's about money with the FTE, particularly for the smaller schools that don't have an FFTE. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Halea, it's a great question. So, so two parts, um, one, uh, the uh, getting the accreditation. Um, one thing, uh, I always, with my policy hat on, I always say, what is the structure now and how can we help access it? One thing that is available right now uh, on the OSPE website is, um, emergency substitute teacher. So one thing I would suggest for Arts Corps and other independent, I've already, I've done this myself, um, is you can start the application to be an emergency substitute teacher in the state of Washington. Um, then in your local school district, uh, there's a process to be an emergency local, uh, to be an emergency substitute teacher in uh, your school district. So you do those two things and you've already kind of got a foot in the door that way. As an emergency substitute teacher, or really just any substitute teacher, I mean, if you don't want to go in that day, you don't have to go in that day. Um, but that kind of starts the process going, your name's in the system, you've got the background check, all that sort of thing. Um, so my hope is that as this bill moves on through into the, uh, out of the Senate, into the House, there are going to be ways to um, kind of replicate that emergency substitute process um, and do that for the arts as well. Um, so that's what I'm kind of digging into. But that's one thing I would suggest to Arts Corps and any other independent teaching artists who are on this call right now is to go ahead and start that process. It's definitely not a like, you know, it's not a BuzzFeed test, you know, click 10 boxes and hey, you're a substitute teacher. There is a process to go through it. But once you do that process, um, then you're already in that system. And that's, it, that'll be easier for us to say, look, You've already doing this for an emergency substitute teachers. We can do this for arts educators right now as well. That's one thing. The second thing was the money. And I'm going to speculate a little bit on this because of the two sponsors of this bill. Uh, this is a, that's a big deal. The two sponsors are Senator Lisa Wellman, who's the chair of the, uh, uh, the Senate uh, K-12, Early Education K-12 Committee. And the second is Senator Rolfes, who is the chair of the Ways and Means Committee. In wonky land, ways and means are that, that. What are the ways we can do this? And do we have the means to do this? They're the ones, the Ways and Means Committee looks at every bill that comes through their committee and gets, gets they go through the, get the, they look at every bill that gets to the Senate and gets to the House. And they say, okay, does this fall within the rule? and they go through all that wonky stuff. Do we have the means? And they go through every line item budget. And I say, okay, we have the ways, the rules, we have the means, the money, we can do it, it's allowed. The chair of the Ways and Means Committee came up with this bill. Mm -hmm. She's sponsoring this bill. And uh, when Manny told me about this, I said, 
oh, that's a great bill. That's nice. Who, who, who's the sponsor? I, I kind of knew Wellman it was. But then it was Senator Rawl, the, the chairwoman of the Ways and Means Committee in the Senate is sponsoring this bill. That speaks volumes to the, the belief in it. Um, and and um, as, as Manny said, I'm going to paraphrase you, Manny, she's not going to waste her time with a bill that's going to die in, die in committee. No, not in virtual Olympia when they have so many bills to move and it takes so much longer to move things because they have a very complicated system because it's virtual. I agree. I have, you know, that's a really good question. And I really, I've been trying to find an answer. I've checked in with OSPI. I've checked in with all of our partners uh, and no one has concrete information about how they will pay for this or what the, or is this, or answer the question even, is this an unfunded mandate? So, and I check every day, twice a day uh, on the bill tracker to see if there's a fiscal note and I haven't seen one yet. So um, it, this bill is gonna get through this. There's, there's powerful senators behind it. It will get through the Senate, you know, and I, and I think that we're gonna have an answer to that question uh, by the time it hits the floor. Like, I feel like that's, that question has gotta be answered by the time they start to vote on it in the Senate, right? And then it'll be hashed out further in the house, right? <clears throat> right. No, a, a fiscal by. note has a fiscal note has been requested. Mm -hmm. um, so that that process is going on, and then there's um, a little bit of how it's going to be paid for. Yeah. You know, right now the entire state is doing special education. You know, special election <clears throat> levy, special election education levy. Yeah. Um, February eighth, I can tell it. Um, and uh, and so that's one way it's being paid. And then that gets into the equities. Again, those smaller districts, you know, they don't have the property tax um, structure uh, as, King, as King County does uh, to help pay for this. Um, however, I, I mean, I can't, I can't stress enough what a big deal it is that Senator Rolfe is, is the mm -hmm. primary yeah. sponsor. Sure. It, 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 it's a really big deal. And also, because um, uh, I, I did address some, some concerns from some arts administrators across the state about an unfunded mandate, which is just like, that's the meat, that's poison. No, you know, no unfunded mandates. Um, it is not an unfunded mandate. It is, for, it is, it is a funded mandate in the sense that the law allows the school district to use existing teachers to teach the minimum requirements in the rubric of BOSTE. Again, we don't want the minimum to be the standard. However, it is a start. And especially since this would not kick in until the 23-24 school year, once this bill is passed at the end of at the end of the session, you know, then we've got, basically have you know just about two years to get those teachers to 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 um, to um, and the funding will be available. It will be mapped out. Um, so, Haleya, sorry, that was that was that was a long-winded way of answering your two questions. Um, That's great. Can I ask a follow-up though? So yeah. Law is allowing for existing to teachers to teach arts curriculum and yet at the same time says that they must be certified within their arts discipline. Right. And, and that's where that emergency substitute part comes in. So they're there. So along with the budget, you know, Senator Rawls, the ways to do it, um, Senator Wellman, um, I think is going to be looking at ways for, you know, that that third grade teacher in you know northern central Washington state to get that arts accreditation um, through OSPE. Um, so again, I don't think they're gonna. I would be very surprised if a lot of school districts said, "Well, hey, our newest teacher just got uh, her accreditation. We're good." Uh, you know, I, I I don't think that's going to be the majority of um, of the school districts. So again, there's there's the way to get this ball rolling for the 23-24 school year for those school districts. Um, and again, because it's not just it's it's there's gonna, there's gonna be mandated kindergarten through eighth grade, so not just the elementary schools, but high but but middle schools as well. Um, they, um, you know, each student has to have a, an arts credit or um, you know throughout their school year. In the regular school day, um, in the regular school day, the same amount of time as social studies, um, uh, language arts, reading, math, science, 
um, they're going to, you know, and in, you know, for middle school, when they start their period classes, you know, one of them is going to have to be an art class, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I just lost the follow up I was gonna oh uh, yes I remember now so we were looking at this with several other arts administrators and arts teachers a few weeks ago with Janet and a question that came up and I have read it several times and still can't answer it is it either or or and performing arts and or visual arts I it's not clear to me Ooh, let me look at this tab none of you can see that's on my laptop right now and see um it's and. I, I, it's it's and. and. Mm -hmm. So I that too. If if I uh, am a teacher in an elementary school, we need to be providing a music class and a visual arts class. Right. Yes. Okay. Yep. One thing I I was thinking about is. Um, I'm nationally certified, but before that, as a teacher, I always was taking uh, classes because I had to get in so many clock or hours or credits. And, um, you know, this is a good opportunity for a lot of the, like the Art Ed um, Association and different um, people who already provide monthly clock hours um, online to also maybe expand a little bit so that some of these teachers can get certified in a second area other than being a elementary teacher or a math teacher. Mm -hmm. So, but I have another question and that was um, about the waiver for special ed, can you, mm -hmm repeat what you said, that there would be a waiver so they wouldn't be taking art classes? So uh, high school, grades nine through 12, this was what, this is, uh, what the State Board of Education um, was concerned about. Um, for, uh, and, and again, this is, this, these will be students who have done K through eight, they've had a visual and performing arts experience through their regular school day, K through eight, starting in 23, 24 school year. Mm -hmm. Then they get to high school and their path is math or science. Um, right now in the state of Washington, a student needs 24 high school credits to graduate. Um, 17 of those are locked in as math, science, reading, and then there are seven that are locked in that are elective. Mm -hmm. They have to take different electives. Um, right now, a student does not have to, right now, as the law stands in 2023-24 school year, a high school student will not need to take an arts, um, a visual performing arts class as an elective to graduate. But the high schools have to offer those classes throughout the school year. So um, uh, the fact that the, and this is where Senator Wellman and Walters, you know, they, they agreed to it. And, and again, I was like, well, if, if they're going with this, then eh. um, But that means that um, high schools must offer these classes to their students throughout their uh, high school education. A student does not have to take a visual or performing arts class as an elective to help meet those requirements. They have to take in K through eight, but they don't have to take them in the high school, but the high school must offer them throughout their nine through 12 ed high school experience. See, that seems rather strange because um, I've taught K through 12 and I, um, last 10 years, I just taught high school. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there were a lot of special ed students in my class. It was one of the first places that they put special ed. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was just kind of, I'm still confused about why they would say they don't have to take it when it really helped them. 
and counselors were very happy to put them in, in my classes. Mm -hmm. Andy, by um, special education, are they meaning uh, students with an IEP that would? Uh, likely, uh, IEP is an individualized education plan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, I would say I would say likely. Um, and to face and to face point, well. You know, I agree that a lot of students who, um, you know, may are on an IEP or in special education, some sort of arts class or arts instruction is going to be beneficial to them. With this bill, they don't have to take it. If it is not beneficial to them, and again, this is, you know, this is after they've done it K through eight, um, they don't have to take it. But the high school building must offer it all the way through. So for those students who are in special education, where the performing arts or the visual arts are helpful to them, are helpful in their education, they can take it, but they're not required to take it. The school is required to offer it. And that's where I, I believe um, Senator Rolfes and Wellman were okay with, with, this, with this substitution. Hmm. Uh, and I see, okay, didn't say there's a two credit arts requirement for uh, 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 Washington State. Yes, there is, and it can be waived. And again, it's not a BuzzFeed quiz they, where they just like check a box and, and, and call it good. There is a process where um, they can be waived. And these are for students who are, you know, if they're on a super strong, you know, science path um, or, math, or math path, and they're taking, you know, college level math classes in their 10th grade year. Um, you know, uh, I, I know I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, but like everyone should be taking an arts class, and of course it's, gonna, it's going to help them. Um, and that's what the case rate experience is for in this in this bill. So again, the really important part of this is that a high school must offer these classes all year round during part of the regular school day. Non-negotiable, they must offer it. It is up to the students and their families to decide if they wanna use those classes as part of their seven credit elective requirements. And the trust, that I think the bill puts is that those K through eight arts classes and teachers are gonna be so amazing and those students and families are gonna see what that arts and arts education is doing for their students and doing for their kids, that of course they're gonna be taking those, those electives um, in high school because those classes are mandated, they must be offered during the regular school day. Well, and I think having uh, it required K through eight that sets them up for success and wanting to choose those classes at the high school level. Say, I agree 100%. Um, yeah, because I saw that substitute and I saw that waiver and I was like, no, 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 no. Um, but, but again, I, mean, I, I, I can't stress enough how important and meaningful it is that Senators Rolfus and Wellman are the two prime sponsors on this. Um, I mean, as, as, again, they are not going to waste their time on a bill that's going to die in the state. Hey, and adding one on a thing to that too, um, we also did reach out uh, to uh, Senator Rolfus. So when when we get when we get a meeting, and to uh, to Senator Wellman. So when we get a meeting, of course, we're gonna ask them directly, "How will you pay for this?" <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, and hopefully we'll find out soon. But you know, I want to flip that whole opportunity conversation into the other side too. I mean, wow. So look at the, the I mean, looking at the senators. I mean, Rolfus sponsored it what moving testimony uh, in public hearing. Senator Wellman was a co-sponsor, but then you start ticking down the, uh, the other co-sponsors, Senator Hunt, Lubbock, Nobles, Wilson. These are powerful members of the Senate. And I know that there is fantastic arts education programs uh, going on in the districts that they serve. And therefore there are fantastic potential or active advocates in those districts as well, right? So when we look towards the future, I mean, we want to play this one all the way out and we want it to deliver uh, to, for the benefit of students that deserve creative learning. But looking at these, I mean, we now have a group of people that really believe in something, the, in the potential and the promise and the and uh, uh, of, of arts education. So I guess something we could talk about later is what could we be talking to them in off session time that they may want to sponsor next year in the next legislative session to support arts learning for schools, right? 
they came up with this on their own. Imagine if we work with them, what could we create together? And that that's a very kind of, a, that's just dropping a little uh, hint towards a, a more expansive conversation we could have. And I know we have to focus on the opportunity at hand, but, um, but I'm very excited by that. I think that there's even more we can do uh, with these uh, great members <clears throat> supporting us. And um, and this is not a bad time uh, since we do know that this will this bill looks like it's moving through and it will end up in the House. Uh, our next advocacy opportunity will be the House Education Committee uh, chaired by uh, Representative Sharon Tomiko Santos because we need this bill to move through the House as well. <clears throat> And we are at past time, so we may want to come to a close. I think we just did. <laughs> uh, thanks, everybody. Um, uh, just a real uh, honor to uh, share this virtual space with you um, and to share this, share the information this bill with your communities, with the schools, and uh, your colleagues. And uh, as Mandy said, uh, this is likely to pass the Senate pretty quickly. So on to the House, and we will be in touch from Inspire Washington to advocate to your house members. Uh, thanks so much. I'm an Andy Thank from you. Inspire Washington. <laughs>